Thanks, Claudia Chiesi. Before the formal introduction, I'd like you to do a little bit of work for me, if you would. Uh, if you don't have regular uh, paper and pen, you can turn your yellow map, uh, your yellow maps over. I'm going to just pose three questions for you to answer. The first is, uh, the United Nations has reported that this country in the Western Hemisphere has had a 263% increase in murder of women and girls between the period of 2005 and 2013. We're looking for the name of a country from the Western Hemisphere. 263% increase in the murder of women and girls. Second question. Name three commodities that are common in the Western Hemisphere to at least three or four countries. So that's a commodity that can be found, grown, cultivated, something or other in three or more countries. That's my phone, which I'm not supposed to be working. It hasn't worked for two days. <laughs> Isn't it sick? Just, oh my God, I got the bad karma. Um, and question number three, there, are, there is a Declaration of Human Rights that the United Nations has posted. How many articles are in that declaration? So we're looking for a number. And then please name two. Now the good news is no one's going to collect your papers and mark it. <laughs> so you can relax. So we're looking for the number of articles in the UN Declaration of Human Rights and Freedoms. And if you would please sketch out two. So now may I introduce you? You may. Yes. 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 Since we're all speechless. Okay. There we go. Okay, I thought perhaps it would be helpful if I introduce myself first because while some of you have seen my face, you might not know who I am. So my name is Diane Greenaway, and in the 80s and 90s, I was uh, a part-time um, what was I? A part-time professor here, right? I taught a class or two. <laughs> and actually, Margie Portley, sitting over there, was one of my very first students. Isn't that hard to believe? And I want you to know, she said nothing in class. Nothing. But she has flowered. <laughs> I actually hired her many years later <laughs> to work with me at Catholic Charities. Anyhow, uh, most recently in 2012, I joined Linda Dinger. Do any of you have Linda Dinger as a professor? I had last year. You had her last year? Okay. She and I uh, went to Uganda and taught in the School of Social Work, a fledgling School of Social Work there uh, for a semester. And what I have to share with you is it was a life-changing experience, okay? Um, I am not the same. And um, a year later, when I went back to Kampala to, for an international conference, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting Kate <laughs> in a special and new way, and Dr. Hilary Weaver. And uh, they uh, informed me that, I want to get this right, really, that um, they, uh, Hillary invited me to be part of the process whereby the UB School of Social Work really worked toward global preparedness of the students, okay? Uh, so not just preparing you to be present on the globe, but to take in what it is of otherness that allows us to let go or suspend, for want of a better word, our worldview and to be able to take in the worldview of otherness in very real world ways from a country not our own. And I think that was uh, Dr. Lacey Sloan's last, um, the, the woman who from the Middle East who spoke with us last time on the, um, the Skype. How many of you were here for her talk? Yeah. I mean, her final uh, suggestion to us as North American social work professionals was that the essence of doing global work is cultural humility. And I think Kate and I both stand up and applaud that because I think it's very real. That is sort of the stance that is so critical when you find yourself in a place not your own. Which brings me to Claudia, okay, uh, today. And uh, Claudia and I are colleagues through our church. When I shared with her that we were hoping to learn more about the migratory process from the Western Hemisphere into the United States in particular, or North America, um, I 
learned that Claudia is a woman who really learned about otherness from her family experience. She uh, spent many adolescent summers in the Caribbean, is that correct? Yeah, and experienced firsthand the level of need that propels people to migrate. Um, I experienced Claudia as a woman who can ask questions, and we know that already. <laughs> who is able to listen and most significantly pose questions of the privileged elite and institutions that too often benefit from the inhumane condition that's conditions that compel people to migrate. There are many parts of Claudia's life, but I'm only going to touch on two uh, that are relevant to our conversation today. So her lifetime commitment has been to men, women, and children who cross borders just to live. And she worked in Florida and in the Buffalo Fort Erie border uh, communities with refugees, asylum seekers, and migrant families. She is also the executive producer of Sugar Babies, a documentary exposing human trafficking of Haitian people to work in the sugar cane fields in the Dominican Republic. And speaking truth to the institutional power of governments, the church, and the sugar industry gives her opportunities to absorb and address the consequences what it means when you really begin to live and advocate for human rights. So in this way, she joins the perspective of Dr. Reverend William Whitler, who was with us uh, earlier in the month, March, I guess, uh, discussing which way home. How many of you were able to, yeah, pretty impressive conversation, wasn't it? Yeah. And he invited us to look at the root causes of this migration. So in that tradition, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Diane. I appreciate it. And my first extension of uh, congratulations is to all of you who took the time to come uh, and to uh, Stephanie and her team, those of you who have been able to help me um, pull together today's presentation. Um, I spent a lifetime in Baldy Hall. I did my master's and doctoral program here, so I'm very sympathetic. <laughs> um, and um, I, it's nice to come home. Um, I thought I would start with some maps, and Stephanie said, oh, it's cool, you got like, real maps, it's like grade school. And, um, and it is that, and for those of you who are visual learners and have a sense, I, I'll talk some little anecdotal pieces, and the maps will begin to make sense, because it's important to me, as we discuss things, and as Diane mentioned, I was asked to center on the Western Hemisphere, but technically the world is what is producing all of the refugees, and in a second or two we'll go through definitions because refugees, immigrants, asylum seekers, these are all different groups of people. Uh, I think I probably don't have to say to you, but please eat or jump up and get food as you see fit to do. So general uh, world map, we're going to talk predominantly about this section, but there are pieces of people from... Uh, Southeast, South Central Asia and parts of Africa who are uh, very much a part of the world of uh, immigration, refugee status in the state. So here is our uh, basic <coughs> fundamental activity and you're going to hear, uh, no surprise to you, that the, the focus is Groups of people coming from around here, 80%, migrating, emigrating, running away, seeking refuge in the United States and Canada. That's the majority of what we're discussing here, 98% of what's happening. There is no reverse migration. We don't see people from here running away to try to live in uh, Honduras. That's not going to happen. So. Uh, and as you move further south into South America, there are fewer. So that's why I draw this little circle around the Caribbean island nation, Central America, and North uh, South America, Northern South America. Doesn't mean they don't, but we're talking about predominance now. And again, I uh, call your attention to South Central Asia because in the work of uh, Western New York, you're going to see these people. Western New York's uh, southern Niagara Peninsula of Canada, they, they will come from here. And distinguishing among and between the, the political groups, the ethnic groups, is, in my judgment, has some significance. Um, larger groups, almost uh, impossible to keep track of, are all the Micronesia, 
um, Macronesia areas and the um, southern parts of Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, particularly Myanmar now, in all of here, there are hundreds, if not thousands of possibilities from here. Every one of the islands could have a person or two, and each has um, not just a different story, but a different background. So we begin with the official collegiate exercise here, definitions. The, this is for the United States. This may be repetitive for some of you. But what our government, the United States government, defines as a refugee is a person who has this fear of persecution. But this is what's most significant. In another country, he or she is elsewhere in Afghanistan, in Colombia, saying, I want to run away to the United States. This is the core of what's happening. Versus an immigrant who is almost always, and I use words like that because if you're familiar with government, there's always an excuse, there's always an asterisk, there's always something. But what it's supposed to be is that you are sponsored by a U.S. citizen. You've got 16 relatives living in Mexico, they want to come and stay with you. You've got you know, 14 people that you know from Somalia who want to come. You are the permanent resident or the citizen and you sponsor them. They choose, again, choose, as opposed to fear of running away, to come to the States or to Canada. Now, you're already here for some reason. You're visiting from Cuba and you're playing baseball and you say, ah, I think I'll live in Miami. Now, you seek asylum in the country. You're here. This, uh, just this past fall, do you remember we had um, two Afghan police people and two Afghan soldiers? And the most amazing story in the world, they got from Cape Cod to Niagara Falls, like in a taxi or some ridiculous, I mean, you couldn't do this, but somehow they got across three states and ended up at the border. No driver's license. Yeah, no, <laughs> just... Yeah. You can't get a cab to go from here to downtown, but they do. So it happens. And I, I bring this to your attention because, you know, sometimes when you have these so-called conversations among and between academics, you think, well, you know, now we've got gospel. We've got some real things here. This is always in flux. And <laughs> Diane's point, I, you, you don't want me to come to anything if you don't want to hear the ugly side of all of this. And if you have money, serious money, you bypass all of these things, and all of a sudden you're a citizen. You show up from Afghanistan, and you have a million dollars, even a half a million dollars. I guarantee you, you will become a citizen. You're not in line for anything. It doesn't happen. So this is a wonderful document that we used the other night at the film, and it has many wonderful websites. A few others are going to be here for your edification, and you can use them. <coughs> Now, in Canada, variation on the English language theme slash attitude. So the Canadians are defining these refugees. Again, they fled their country, fear of persecution, but they don't go into a must apply elsewhere. They don't say that. It's implied, but it doesn't have to happen. And then they separate here the, immig the immigrant from the refugee choosing to settle permanently, as if a refugee would not. But again, you can see the, the use of language. They choose to settle permanently in Canada. Refugees are forced to flee, but they are, once they get here, are choosing to settle. So it's, they're not mutually exclusive, is my point. And again, you can go to uh, the Canadian websites and get the details. Canada has, when um, in time period of it, 2006 to 2009, when I was working at a, um, a refugee organization downtown Buffalo in Vive, and we were transiting people from Buffalo to Fort Erie to be processed um, to go on to uh, life in Canada, the rule was different. And sometime in the 2009 time period, Canada changed. So it had a list of countries, we'll say a dozen, of uh, countries where they welcomed refugees. 
then there was some brouhaha in Ottawa, and it changed, and the list of countries changed. In quite, not quite overnight, but within a month. So people in your business and in uh, attending businesses would have to be alert to this, because as soon as you think you're running down this path, you've got a whole three or four families, and you think they're going under one set of rules, all of a sudden you get literally to the border, and boop, we change, and now we have a different set of not just circumstances, but paperwork and expectations. And this will continue because it's been the nature of governments and agencies and things of that nature. Uh, the migrant, now that it, it's used in our uh, language here and in the advertising, this is not about migrants as is generally understood, again, by the actual rules and regulations. A migrant person is supposed to be engaged, <laughs> fancy word for work, remunerated activity. That means work that you get paid for as opposed to slavery, which we have many people. Because in Western New York, there is an interesting burst of interest in because there has been trafficking in persons, both in the hotel business, sex trade is always the way, but also in some agribusiness. And those people are not being paid, or they are being promised pay, and then they don't get paid, which is the same thing as not being paid, period. So I separate this out because I have not done in Western New York, the work of the migrant worker. Several people at Vive, where I worked, worked in particularly in Genesee County, some in Orleans, where there are um, lots of farms. And so the migrants are here. They are also picked up by ICE and various other government uh, agents, tormented, some you know, without any cause. But today's activity is not about the people who are coming to do what I'll call seasonal work, seasonal labor for which you are paid. Picking lettuce, potatoes, you're paid, you go back to wherever it was you came from. And but they come in, the migrants come in under a status though, right? They're uh, supposed to be, it's yes. Yeah. And it's usually, usually a group, it's usually some kind of sponsorship by an agency, a large farm, the county, you know, they send down a couple of buses, you pick up 600 people from Mexico, you schlep them up to Western New York, they do their thing for three months and you send them back. But, as you're going to see and you're probably going to tell me, uh, people, let me think, I could live in Chihuahua or I could live in Chihuahua. Um, you know, people choose to stay, they go underground, they run away, they pretend to be somebody else. And now you have all kinds of ramifications that uh, emanate from what is a relatively simple definition. And this is my point, I'm not telling you anything you probably don't already know at least a little bit. And then human trafficking, you will just hear me uh, reference because I, I do do a fair amount of work in this area, but it's not covered today. But again, these are um, uh, in, uh, in the real world, downtown Buffalo at Vive. These are some of the children with whom I worked uh, a couple years back, and there was a kind of a recreation room where the children would, would play. Uh, Vive is on Wyoming Avenue in Buffalo. Um, we had an international day, and these are good friends from Colombia, and each of them came for um, uh, and produced uh, a presentation from their country. Sometimes it was food, sometimes it was artwork. Chad was one of, it'll be one of my favorite stories, um, and this young woman is uh, one of the refugees from Chad. Um, this is Sister Norbert, who is one of the Sisters of St. Francis of uh, Reese Street in Williamsville at the Freedom Bowl working with Ugandan refugees. Just, I digress, but I have to do this. Sister Norbert was my high school chemistry teacher. So I, I'm in there as part of the board of Vive, and in comes Sister Norbert. It's very humbling. And I said, oh, hello, Sister And then I immediately like, shrink down to size. And, um, wonderful human being, wonderful, wonderful person. And that's one of the joys of coming home is you have all these interconnections. So Sister Norbert's there with a full heart. And this is Claudia with her Somali refugees 
all on the same day, these people are getting ready to transit to Canada. And then another favorite group, the Tibetans, they're also getting ready. There's a quite a community in the Toronto area of the Tibetans, and they're getting ready to transit. And again, these are anecdotes that when I elaborate a little bit, you'll see how the cross-cultural effects are so significant. And I think maybe when you mentioned about you were new to Western New York and looking, th these people are coming through downtown Buffalo. This, they're just not like something that you talk about. They really do show up here and they're walking the streets, most of them safely. And this is when I worked with migrant children in Homestead, Florida. This is slightly south of Miami. You remember it because of Hurricane Andrew in the 90s that obliterated it. Majority of these children, this is in a school that is on the, uh, I'm going to use the word compound. Uh, it, uh, it's really the farming community where people live in what we might describe as uh, like mobile homes. They're not shacks. They're uh, very uh, modest dwellings. And the... These are obviously young children, and then a few come in right after school program and do reading and writing and appropriate kinds of things. But these are predominantly Mexicans, but some others from Central America, and particularly Guatemala. And families come again to do agribusiness. Uh, Florida has a very long season, so they can pick uh, beans and stuff for eight or ten months and supposedly they go back and then supposedly they come back but they have migrant status and again I just offer you that and these are uh, the Haitian children who are uh, trafficked into the Dominican Republic to work um, in the sugarcane field this is you know, just an abomination and an atrocity that I have Unfortunately, I've had primary uh, work experience with. So these these children and their families are stolen, my word, from Haiti under the guise of you're going to go and get a job in the ER. But of course, you do have a job, meaning you have work, but you don't have any pay. And then you see various ages, very young, kind of preteenish people and. Um, that's the uh, basis of the film, The Sugar Bee. Now, here at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I don't expect everybody to read all of them real quickly, but I find some of them more fascinating than others uh, because they, um, they're so expansive. And if one were to pay attention to them, the countries that signed on to this, including all the countries that I'll note for you in the, like the DR, like Nicaragua, Honduras, and just don't pay any attention to them, as do the United States on some occasions, too. So that you do have uh, the right to asylum. You talked about that group. You have the right to a nationality and the freedom to change it. A lot of people don't pay attention to that, but any among us, if you're a U.S. citizen, could choose to become an Afghan if you wanted to. There are 30 of these, 30 articles, and... Um, I just point to Article 2, the right to Social Security is not Social Security, as you know, in the United States. Small mass social the security of being in a society. But the right to own property, freedom of religion, the right to get an education, adequate living standard, and my personal favorite, the right to rest and leisure, which a lot of people don't even imagine to be a right. Uh, obviously, you have some are freedoms and some are rights, but they um, move towards the same end result. Significant um, variation of the Bill of Rights in the United States. And uh, we end with, and I give credit, this is Habitat's map. But I thought Habitat did a nice job in their calendar this year that by, again, teaching people with the map, drew so they'll have a picture of somebody from the Philippines and then they have a corresponding number so that if you are map challenged, geography challenged, you can actually find out. I just mentioned to Stephanie in the hallway, I've been stunned and amazed at the lack of geographical knowledge, real understanding of what it means to be on the other side of the world. And I, so I'm going to digress. Any questions for a second? I'm going to go to a few anecdotes to help with that. For instance, now, um, 
I'll start with uh, Salvador. And so we're talking about um, El Salvador, which is approximately here. And one of the stories, there, there are two stories, but uh, a couple of years ago, at, uh, I have a, a summer home in Canada, and I invited the refugees from the Fort Erie group to come to my home. And it's a, if you lived in western New York and you've ever gone to Canada and Crystal Beach in the summer and grew up around here, it's, it's just a semi-rural, quiet space with some cottages. The houses are getting a little fancier now, but in the early days you didn't, really, you didn't have sewers, so you had a well water. But anyway, I want to just paint the picture that it's a small, modest, clapboard usually house, and then there's open space. And so my property ends at the blackboard, and then uh, Jack's opens over there, and Susan's is over here, and you might have a couple of trees, and but it's not blocked off. Every the visual is straight across, and then you go down two streets, and you're in Lake Erie. It's just it's very flat, very open. Um, if you've traveled at all, anything from Middle East, parts of North Africa some of Europe, and now in, uh, in the Western Hemisphere, south of the United States. Things in the United States has done is now what we call gated communities. But there's a wall around everything, including the highways. You see all those things. That's new. That wasn't around in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, bordering up everything. But this man, who was from Salvador, had been here 15 years, and he came, he, he was, uh, I think he had a doctorate in chemistry. Could have been like biochemistry, don't hold me to that. But a science, high-end science person. And uh, th there was a fair amount. It was during the time when uh, Archbishop Romero was assassinated. And uh, people of that particular level of education were considered not persona non grata, but certainly dangerous because they were thinking on their feet. They were arguing with the government. They were uh, essentially talking about the abuses. Well, they ran this dude out on a rail just slightly ahead of the torture and the gangs. And he and his family went their way all the way up here, which I probably should go to the first Well, you can look at your own maps then and go back to the center. So this shows you better. If he's over here, he's got to get to here. And, you know, he's not driving. He's not on a bus. He has to find a way with him, the wife, and three kids. Somehow or other, they get to Buffalo, they get to Fort Erie, and uh, again, it's 15 years ago, and he was going to go and stay with relatives and friends, and, uh, and quickly, and he got to Fort Erie, and his, he's telling me this in my backyard, he said, this is paradise. This is the most wonderful place on the planet. And, you know, it was 52 degrees, and everybody was like, oh, my God, we can't go to the beach. And he comes from a land of 87 degrees. But nobody complained about the weather. His view that he could look out onto other people's land, into other people's yards, to access a door, to even visualize the door to your house is right there, and mine is here, and there's not a wall in between. It, uh, it bespeaks this level of trust. It's extraordinary. But people around here don't think about it that way. But this is what a real refugee seeks. They seek safety, social security. This is, this is what's important. It doesn't matter if it's 20 below zero. You can, not that you would wander over and keep banging on their door, but that it's just so open. And he ended up teaching Latin in a Catholic school in Port Colbert. Stayed there, never moved, didn't go to Toronto, didn't do anything else, never did any work with his doctoral program, happy as could be, because he had had this sense of security. But I was stunned by, it was the physical presence of this openness that uh, was so appealing. Another story is told to me at the people at Vive that some man, when they're, uh, they're back in Salvador, um, was caught in the crossfire of their civil war. And people were being shot and maimed and slaughtered in the streets. He picks up his son, who is now, uh, I'm going to call it paraplegic, I'm assuming is 
paralyzed from the waist down because the, the story goes he could not walk. And they tell me, and I have no reason to doubt the good sisters who started Vivian, that he carried this child to the United States on his back. So he had to walk, crawl, be in a buggy or a, you know, the back of a tractor or something, all the way through these countries, wander all the way around here, cross at Brownsville, Texas, get some kind of Vive connection, and get all the way up here, carrying this kid on his back, walking. Stunning stories, amazing stories. Anything to get out, to get away, to survive. And I, I, again, I tell you these stories because they, they have, um, in my judgment, the, the human purpose that we can tell you why the government does what it does, but this is the kind of motivation that happens. Now, there are other people who are motivated by very different things, i.e. crime. So having, bless you. So having said all of that, there is this other underbelly of the refugee immigrant world, and it cannot be uh, overstated. It's very serious, and I think the challenge for those of us who are interested is understanding that discrimination, being able to differentiate among and between those with the clear the clear and uh, verifiable message and those that are more interested in something more nefarious. Um, I, can you teach that in a course? Probably not. But you certainly have to cultivate the instinct that goes along with that. Um, the <coughs> Chad stories and the Tibetan stories I'll just leave you with because the, you saw the Tibetan man and one of my jobs at Vway was with the cross-cultural things well, I can do Honduras too. People come to the United States. You have an idea of what Tibet's like? No. The, um, the Himalayas, Mount Everest. This is where these people live. Mount Everest is 29,000 plus feet high. They usually live around 18,000, something like that. <laughs> they come to western New York, which is at and below sea level. This is no minor shift and change, any more than if you wanted to go and move and live in the Rockies where you used to live in the Alps. It's a different, different world. So I, and I said to him, he said, oh, we're going to go to Toronto. I said, really? You're going to live in Toronto? How, how do you do that? How do you come from 18,000 feet to sea level to, and we're back to the, not just the cultural change, but the geography is so stunning. And they, they were saying how this was going to become um, a physiological problem to, to readjust. You know how some people get altitude sickness and stuff? They have the reverse. And uh, it, it now becomes what you really thought was going to be English class. Now you're really talking about this other kind of thing. So things that maybe each of you has taught, thought about is not always covered in the interview for the refugee. Um, the Honduran uh, man and his family, I worked with specifically in um, at B Day, and he had very limited English. I know about seven words in Spanish, and but the ten-year-old boy child was doing a, a kind of a translation. So we're talking now. They've shown up in Vive, downtown Buffalo, in their flip-flops, pair of shorts, and a tank top. This is the costuming that they've come with. Now in August, that works. Now, what do you say to these people? I said, well, where are you going? Oh, we're going to Red Hat, Alberta. I said, Alberta, Canada? Really? Um, yes, my brother lives there, and he has a job for me. Really? Um, do you know anything about Alberta? Do you know like, how you're going to go to school or what you're going to do in December? No clue. No one has informed this person then it's 11 below zero in Alberta for three months of the year. And you get back into this thing. So now I find myself, I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to do English, language, grammar, syntax. I'm teaching people what a mitten is, how to wear gloves, how to wear you know, a, a, three layers of clothes, what it means to have a hood on, and how do you wear a scarf. I mean, the most fundamental things that normal people would do when they're two and three and four years old. Um, <coughs> Very significant, and this this is part of the process while you're doing the paperwork, which is certainly important. These other things, because I couldn't put them on a bus to Alberta 
and say, you're on your own. I mean, I couldn't do it. Maybe somebody else could. But it, I, I tell you those stories because they have um, general significance uh, down the road and into the process of people. Now, with your permission, we're going to shift and go over here, um, uh, flip around and do 1959 work on the blackboard. Uh, when Diane first talked with me about this as a uh, possibility was in the November time period. And it probably doesn't seem reasonable to expect, but in that first week of November, during the, hi Claudia, I think we're going to do something, would you be interested? November 8th, to bear with me with a brief. Bless you. PBS NewsHour uh, traveled to El Salvador to report on gang violence that has forced many Salvadorans to seek a new life in the United States. Violence isn't confined to El Salvador's borders. Residents from other Central American countries, including Guatemala and Honduras, also experience similar fears. Oscar's family was being extorted by a local gang, and when the family couldn't pay the money the gang demanded, his father and brother were murdered. November 8th. November 3rd. Not Western Hemisphere, but off of Istanbul, tens of thousands of migrants from Africa, the Middle East, and beyond pack into often unsafe boats, boats uh, to enter the European Euro Union. Loaded with 42 Afghan illegals, including 12 children and 7 women, the boat capsized on its way to either Bulgaria or Romania. They couldn't decide. All of it. Okay. So, then I'm looking at the thing, and um, we're back to Western New York, and it's November 14th, and here we are at the Peace Bridge. Peace Bridge um, tractor trailers stopped for inspection for a load of rolled steel. A second look finds something far different. Hidden under a blanket in the cab are two Albanians. The driver now finds himself accused of human smuggling. It's an outstanding job by our white officers, the U.S. Customs and Border people say. The driver is charged with bringing in aliens in exchange for financial gain, was arraigned by the magistrate McCarthy in downtown Buffalo. He faces up to 10 years in prison. The two Albanians are plead guilty to misdemeanor charges of illegal entry, sentenced to time served, sent back to Canada, and this dude, the truck driver, is a free security trade card holder. That means fast. You have to actually apply for this and say that you're legitimate and blah, blah, blah. And a member of, get this, the Trusted Traveler Program. So our boy's doing double time here. This is my point about you have the work, you have the lie, you have the subterfuge, you have cash flow. This is about always always about the money. And so I thought we would just wander over here and do some the conversation about what might be uh, the reasons for the refugees. Uh, and again, we can just do our hemisphere, but we can extrapolate out. What might you think are some of the, I have listed geopolitical and socioeconomic, what, what would you think are geopolitical, for instance? What drives people? <coughs> Yes. Yes. Sir. Exploitive government practices. And I would say things like uh, dictatorships, the troikas, the um, quasi-political uh, family uh, royalties, whatever you want to call those. Yes, um, Sort of under government practices, but paramilitary um, involvement. So you have this... Um, In, in, you know, 
for listing them, but in point of fact, you know, these things are all interconnected in some way. Can't have a war without having paramilitary interests. Can't have paramilitary interests unless you have some kind of government or fake government that's pretending to do something. Um, then we have socioeconomic, which I think are a little more um, common to us because uh, it, it comes into every, in both first, second, and third world countries. What might they be? Socioeconomic conditions that are triggering the um, interest, the fleeing, or the something. Yes, ma'am. Like jobs, high paying jobs, or jobs that provide a um, living wage? Jobs and clubs. Yes. I think along with that is um, lack of like government support for people when they're like there's no necessarily welfare system or something like that. So if you don't have a job, there's no support. Job or land? I mean, starvation. Uh, how do you? <laughs> what the list first? <laughs> starvation, poverty. Um, Stephanie, it would be fair to say government infrastructure or lack of it. Lack. Well, this is this is the social security that was mentioned in the thing. If you don't have a, a net of some kind uh, in your own country, and, uh, I'll use the word security here because one of the other things you have to go to here is what I'll call physical security. We're talking about um, policing because you. You know, somebody breaks into your home, call 911. No. And the people who are breaking into your home are part of the local government's uh, police force. I, I, I hesitate to call it that, but you know, this, this is a, gangs, only they have different costumes. That's the only difference. Mm -hmm. So if I'm breaking and entering, who am I going to call? The other gang to come and throw you out? So you, you don't have recourse. So when it comes to extortion, and people come to your little tobacco stand or your orange juice cart, and they say, give me half of what you earned today, and you say, go screw yourself. I don't have to do anything. Well, how about your kids don't come home from school today? I mean, th these are profound kinds of decisions. You don't get to just tell somebody to go take a hike. That's not, nor, as I indicate, can you, there's no way to call because these people are part of the problem. It's part of the whole issue. And I am mindful of the time, so those of you who have to leave, just take your opportunity to do so. So uh, socioeconomic things, um, all of jobs and income, starvation, you know, poverty, you know, economics, we can call it. But all of this is tied to this. Yes, sir. I was just going to say, too, on a macro level, um, free trade, which, you know, if we have subsidies in the United States and there aren't subsidies in other countries for agriculture and other businesses, then there's no opportunity for those companies or those countries to improve their economy because they're not exporting. And, yeah. Yes, and um, where I, I will now move to uh, the, the nastier side of this is that this is all uh, person organized. This is not something from the netherworld. Like, you know, the gods didn't get together last week and say, let me go to school with the earth. That's not how this works. These are small groups of people, but very powerful, who arrange to have poverty. Now, with the exception of, like, drought, you can have uh, the production of coffee and cocoa and oil, and cocaine, and sugar, and cotton, but you can also manipulate those commodities so that you don't have so much of them to sell so that the price will go up. But the regular people aren't getting the price going up. That's not how the system works. So now you, you can impoverish an entire country uh, with one of the richest uh, bases in anything. I'll, let me go back to the Western Hemisphere. The next real powder keg is Venezuela. It's been simmering, but Venezuela, I asked you to do commodities. People, give me a couple of examples of what you used as commodities. Oil. Oil. 
but certainly Brownsville, Texas is a huge crossing, some parts near El Paso and the San Diego border. But as you all know, they also seep through, walk across the Rio Grande, and come in through those dangerous little portals all along the way. Every once in a while, we don't get as many people on the ships and the boats as they do in the Mediterranean, but every once in a while you do then, you'll see some Cuban refugees, a few patients in the boat, catch sizes and 100 people fall into the Florida streets. But that's not usually how it works. Our refugees will take the trains through uh, Mexico, which you saw in the <coughs> film, die along the way, get beaten along the way, get robbed, raped, all kinds of things. And then at different points along in the United States, they, uh, if the United States does not recognize their country and you're not on the list, then as they choose to go more, uh, north, they will try to find their way to Canada. They don't, they don't leave um, unless somebody here can, can help me with some bona fide information. I don't know too many of these people who say, well, I'll take a boat and go to China and emigrate there. That's not, that doesn't happen. They might go to Iceland, maybe, but no, I mean, that's just not how the system works. So they're going north. Um, they rarely come south, even though, I mean, I can argue that Bolivia has got its own problems, Uruguay, Paraguay, I mean, these places are, are not exactly um, paradises in their governmental structure, but at least they would have the commonality of language and a little bit of the, of the uh, geography, but that's not how the system works. It's, um, and I mentioned to Diane, and I'll end with this, is some of it is from the United States, is we export the dream, particularly like in films, and advertising like that. People in these countries, like you saw that kid in the film said, I wanted to go to Manhattan. I said, how does he know anything about Manhattan? You know? So this is a person who has nothing. I mean, lives in uh, essentially a shack. And he's going to go to Manhattan? What was he, 12, 13 years old? To do what? You know, you're going to end up in Canal Street saying, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, he can't do anything. Not because he's an imbecile, but because he's 12 or 13 years old with no language skill and no prospects. But uh, I wonder, people who have no running water, very little to eat, have access to a cell phone. Somehow get to see the advertising of half-dressed women galloping along San Monica Boulevard. Oh, I think I'll go there. That's a good idea. That looks like a fun place. So we are often our own worst enemies because that's you know, people don't pick up on the local documentaries of what's going on. So, again, in your business, those of you who are entering this noble profession, those of you already in it, it, um, it you know, bespeaks this larger, um, both a question and, a su and uh, seeking a solution. Um, and as we uh, wind down, I, I put out some of the maps, some of the uh, countries without borders, a basic political map and then the United States. So again, on something like this, you can get a, a really good visual of what it means to cross from southern Texas to get to Buffalo to cross over to Medicine Hat in Alberta. And um, I, I'll end with the Vive story, but I'll also ask you that if you, know, if you don't have good maps and you can get some text, this is a wonderful text already uh, 12 years old, but this has um, all manner of um, the geopolitical and sociopolitical maps and the legends that apply to them. So this, this talks about uh, migration, money, crops, uh, weather. Um, it's just good to have on your bookshelf. But the fact of the matter is things change often, so they usually only do this every 10 years or so. So you do have to keep up with it. Um, and, and have uh, as good an atmosphere as, you know, as you possibly can have nearby. Um, I got this child's map of Africa so that I actually could go back to when you teach people things so they could color it. It was very useful. So if you ever have like, kids and you can find something like this, they, um, the learning just jumps up. They learn you know, really, really quickly with that. Any questions? Anything I can help people with or wonder about? I realize I'm talking fast. And... Yes, sir. Um, so you started with a question, a country in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, yes. What country was that? Honduras. 
It also has the highest murder rate in the world. It's also predominantly <coughs> Catholic, which is very heart-wrenching to me. Not because I'm tied to the Vatican, but the Catholic Church in particular is very rigid about not killing people. <laughs> and uh, you would think that's familiar with, but I mean, most Christianity, <laughs> that's one of the commandments. But, well, just before people are slaughtered, they're all making the sign of the cross. They got pictures of the Virgin Mary on the wall. They got crucifixes in Jesus and the Pope, and then they slaughter everybody. They killed Miss Honduras in the fall. She was just crowned two weeks later. They slaughtered her and her sister, 19, 22 year old. Just loaded them down like nothing. Yes, Honduras is a huge problem. Guatemala is right behind them, and Salvador is like neck and neck. They're, they're, it's a big fight. And you know, um, see, I'm not a good person for these things because I have all these things. There are people on the internet, and I got into it from, was it Airbnb? was one of these places, or TripAdvisor, one of these things, where they're advertising, where you can go and buy a, a, rent a house and live in somebody else's property and stuff like that. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, the last few months, while I was out of the country, in that territory, um, I got things about, uh, they're building a new, uh, I call them encampments, because they're all gated communities. One in Nicaragua, and parts of, Panama and northern Costa Rica. They were just getting close to the Guatemala uh, Honduras border. Now, let me be fair. You can buy an acre of land for five dollars there. This, you know, this is true. But in order to live there, and, and where they were advertising to U.S. citizens, people my age who are getting ready to retire, and you could live there like a king for two dollars a day. This is true. But you know what? You got to be airlifted from the airport into your compound because you can't transit. You're not out wandering around. When you get these cheap trips, I bet you everybody here knows somebody who's gone to the DR uh, for vacation at Punta Cana. Huge, sinful space. But you land in Santo Domingo, you're on the bus, you go to the compound, you don't wander around outside. You wouldn't. Because not only will you be killed, the um, the reputation of the space and people. My own friends, my childhood friends. Oh, I can't wait to go. I'm going to go to the DR. It's only six hundred dollars. I said, Dolly, do you know why would it be six hundred dollars for a week at a major resort? How do you think they can do that? They don't pay their people. I mean, they have. What I would call slaves. These are their housekeepers. These are their bartenders. These are the people who are running the um, so-called water sports. <clears throat> They're not getting paid. So if you want to go to uh, Montego Bay or you want to go to Aruba, you're going to pay twelve, thirteen hundred dollars a week because these people are going to pay their people. So this is just <clears throat> logical. Listen. This, so when people say, "Well, I didn't know," trust me, if the price is too low. Something is wrong because it simply cannot happen. So these are the significant pieces. I leave you with the idea of the atlas, some of the pictorial things, and I um, thank you for your time. Thank you.